While international condemnation intensifies over the spy poisoning attack, Russia is gearing up for Sunday's president, presidential election, where Vladimir Putin is widely expected to win. So here to walk us through all of this is uh, CBSN contributor Gabe Lipton. He writes for Signal, a newsletter produced by G Zero Media. Hey, thanks for joining us. Great to be with you. So listen, I feel like we've been talking for a long time about every time there's an election uh, that, you know, this is it for Vladimir Putin. His popularity is tanking right. because the economy is tanking. Yeah. It's been, you know, terrible for a while. You write in the newsletter, 20 million people live below the par poverty line yep. in Russia, yet he seems as popular as ever. Yeah, I mean, it, for outside observers, it's sort of hard to understand why Putin remains popular. He's going to win on Sunday in a landslide. And I think the real reason is that Russians see him as a force of stability. They see him as delivering the country from a period of chaos in the 1990s to sort of the last decade and a half mm -hmm. of general stability, economic stability domestically. I mean, Russia's not an economic success story. They've grown about 73 percent during his tenure. But, you know, they're more stable than they were in the 90s, where the economy completely collapsed. Domestic uh, uh, security stability, you no longer have sort of terrorist attacks, major separatist movies. And then thirdly, delivering Russia back onto the global stage, whether it's through the U uh, invasion in Ukraine, mm. the war in Syria, meddling, you know, in the West and, and making the world feel like Russia is again back as a global superpower. So it's, you know, you know, he remains popular because he is, again, this force for stability. And do you think the sort of the complicated relationship that he has with President Trump also is having an impact on his popularity there? I think so. I think so a little bit. But again, I think it's this more forceful forcefulness especially abroad mm -hmm. after the russian invasion uh, of ukraine in 2014 his popularity rose about 20 percent it's around eight, uh, 80 percent now and it's stayed mm -hmm. basically consistent since then right. so he's using very tactfully these foreign interventions uh, to, for domestic political reasons, mm -hmm. uh, beyond the obvious foreign policy reasons let's talk about this poisoning uh, it strikes me that Using what many people would term a weapon of mass destruction, an adversary using that on another adversary, on their soil, warrants a perhaps even greater response than what Britain has already done, mm -hmm. which is to expel diplomats. Uh, and I just wonder if we're not thinking about it, or we should be thinking about it in that way, that the Russians using this weapon, and they've done it in the past, they're doing it with impunity. And shouldn't that worry people more? I get it that there are sanctions being imposed from the United States and, you know, what the U.K. is doing, but it feels as if for the Russians the consequences for doing these types of actions are not that they don't, they don't mind. They don't care that they're being sanctioned um, because they keep doing them. Mm -hmm. Look, I, I totally agree with you. I think the, the Western response on this and other has, has been pretty weak. And I don't think this will lead to sort of a coherent, cohesive Western response more broadly. I think one of the big lessons since the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine is that actually Russia can tolerate much more pain through economic right. sanctions, political sanctions, than the, U than the West is willing to impose on it. So I think you go... I mean, if ISIS did this, if ISIS was the one to have done something like this, and we found out that it came from a country in the Middle East, I don't think the response would be we're just expelling some diplomats. No, I, I completely agree with you. And I, again, I mean, we expelled 23 diplomats. You know, they're contemplating more sort of asset freezes, but we're not going to get sort of like broad sectoral sanctions that you would expect. Mm. And part of that is because there's massive amounts of Russian capital in flowing into London. There's massive divisions within the EU on sanctions policy. The transatlantic relationship between the U.S. and Europe is, is sort of in flux, and they don't agree on what a common approach to Russia is. So this, I don't think, again, this sort of... Uh, heralds a new era of Western uh, blowback against Russia for doing these things, whether it's poisoning mm -hmm. uh, a spy in the UK or meddling in elections. I mean, it, you may see some sort of tit-for-tat stuff, but it's not a new That's the, dynamic. That's sort of the answer so, I was looking for. It's about money. Right, yeah, probably. I, but, you know, the Russians are sort of responding. You hear about this blacklist now. Now, yeah. you know, it can be argued that the U.S. response was sort of tepid as well, mm. because a lot of those Russians on the list were already being indicted by Mueller anyways. Exactly. It took the president, you know, a while to get around to signing <laughs> that bill that Congress passed in the summertime. Mm -hmm. Still, you know, we, we have our list of people that we want out of the country, and they're responding with their own list of Americans they, you know, want out. Are we sort of inching our way slowly towards a serious conflict? 
I don't think so. I mean, I think, again, I think what you're going to see is a sort of tit for tat. And just as the West doesn't want to impose sanctions on Russia, increase sanctions because it's worried about flows from out of Russia, the Russians are also worried about imposing sort of uh, sanctions on Western companies mm. because they're worried about the precedent would set. They're worried that companies wouldn't want to invest in Russia because they perceive that if in the next year or two their money is sort of insecure, it could be under U.S. sanction. Mm -hmm. That's not a good thing. So. The Russian strategy is to de-escalate on the sanctions mm -hmm. front, on the financial front, because it knows that there's this sort of un slightly stable equilibrium. Follow right. the money, just like Vlad said. Exactly Follow right. about the money. Mm -hmm. Follow exactly the money. Right. All right, uh, let's switch gears a little and talk about Saudi Arabia. 60 Minutes will air a very rare interview with Saudi Crown Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman this Sunday. Last November, he led the anti-corruption crackdown and arrested several Saudi princes, businessmen, members of the royal family, former govern mm -hmm. government officials. His own relatives. Up, put him yeah. at the Ritz-Carlton. <laughs> That's what the... Uh, uh, that's the jail. It was that's a the jail. It was a prison, <laughs> nonetheless, uh, for them. Yeah. Um, one of the top advisors, Mohammed Al Sheikh, was closely involved in what happened at the Ritz, and he also spoke to 60 Minutes. Let's play a little bit of that. What happened at the Ritz? Anti-corruption crackdown was was very simple. We we had a serious problem with corruption. The Crown Prince actually spoke about it uh, a couple of times publicly and said we have a real problem. And given the structure of some of these uh, corruption cases, we were worried that if we started processing people one at a time, that some of the money might be siphoned out of the kingdom, that it would have a severe negative impact on the country and the economy. We had to do what we did at the Ritz. For foreigners who live in a democracy where there are charges filed, there's due process, there's a trial, could they look at this and say, mm, I'll take my money elsewhere? But even in democracies where there is due process, there is trial, there's also settlement uh, procedures. And a lot of people do go through these settlement procedures. Were you surprised it took as long as it did? Because the, the Ritz was closed for a while. Given the magnitude and, and, and the size of, of what happened, I actually think it was an accomplishment that it happened so quickly mm -hmm. uh, and that it was dealt with in, in, a, in what I believe a, a very efficient manner. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, breaking news, there's corruption in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. I mean, the reality is that, explain for our viewers, is this about corruption or is this about consolidation of power by the prince? It's an important question. So there are really two types of anti-corruption drives. There are those that are led by independent prosecutors that are basically trying to sort of root out illicit activity in the political classes. And then there are the types of anti-corruption drives that we've seen in Russia and in mm -hmm. China and, and increasingly in Saudi Arabia that are more about one uh, sort of unit of the political class targeting another, mm. right? So I think, I Vlad, sort of as your question suggests, I think this is more about sort of attacking, you know, uh, 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 Prince Al Crown Prince Salman consolidating power, you know, taking out, uh, out you know, people who might be against him in, in, within the political class, but then also over time transforming the political economy, right, and getting rid of these sort of uh, patronage networks that exist in Saudi Arabia, whether it's through, you know, dishing out oil money or other sort of uh, types of patronage, right? So I think this is more about sort of political right. maneuvering. It's not sort of your independent uh, anti-corruption drive that we saw and see in Brazil and other parts of the right. world. Well, he's making a lot of social changes, that changes that could receive a lot of pushback sure. from certain people. So Absolutely. why not see if you can shut that down ahead of time, right?